and then I'll post that up on uh, D2L when that's all done. Okay. So today, again, we're kind of our, our first workshop in uh, <clears throat> this class. So we spent most of this class so far talking about uh, kind of those nuts and bolts issues, right? Case formulation, treatment planning, session ske schedules, um, you know, how to kind of find and choose evidence-based treatments. So now I want to take that information and shift a little bit into, okay, well, what does this actually look like when I'm doing treatment, right? Like, what does this look like when I'm on the ground actually doing treatment for these various problems? And that's why this is our, our first kind of uh, sample workshop. So we're going to start out with um, probably my personal favorite problem to treat, which is obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, just kind of a little bit of a background. Um, so my primary interest and area of research in graduate school was actually uh, trauma and anxiety-based problems. Uh, so particularly looking at PTSD, how that presents in youth across time, uh, who is and is not impacted by uh, traumatic events, things like that. And then when I went on my clinical internship to the University of Florida, um, I was very fortunate and was able to hook up and kind of hook into uh, our specialty clinic down there that treated obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, at the time, it was one of literally the top treatment places in the world for OCD. Uh, and we had people coming from, you know, all over the country and outside of the country to come in for uh, both intensive and weekly treatments with uh, us. So I got a, a huge amount of experience working with OCD there, and, and I just loved it. Um, I just loved working with these families and being able to help them see incredible progress in relatively short amounts of time. And that, you know, honestly, um, kind of rekindled my enjoyment of doing therapy. Um, prior to that, I was really leaning more towards focusing on assessment work uh, and evaluation and diagnostic work. And part of that was because, um, you know, in all honesty, I wasn't really trained very well in how to do good evidence-based therapy in graduate school. Uh, I was kind of, you know, given some overview and basics, uh, but I wasn't really kind of given the, you know, the hands-on direct training in how to do these things. And so when I actually got that with these populations that are so amenable to change, was like, oh my God, it turns out I love therapy. Like assessment, get out of here. You're, you're fine, you're fine, whatever. But anyway, let me, let me treat these really anxious kids and do some amazing work with those families. So what we'll cover today, kind of in our part one, uh, is we'll talk about you know, what causes OCD, um, you know, what does it look like, what is it, uh, what all does doing cognitive behavioral therapy with OCD uh, entail and then how well does it work all right so we're going to kind of hit these four these four pieces today so most of you all um, have had you know pretty much your entire educational career uh, in psychology at least under the auspices of the dsm-5 which came out in 2013 um, the dsm as a, a relatively controversial document for a very large number of reasons, um, but it's still kind of our, uh, our most widely used diagnostic scheme. Uh, and when we switched from DSM-4 to 5, uh, DSM-4 was published actually in the early 90s, DSM-5, like I said, in 2013, there was an entirely new <clears throat> chapter and classification uh, that was titled Obsessive Compulsive and Related Disorders. And what this category did was it pulled together diagnoses from a lot of other categories and it made some new ones up into official diagnoses. So the kind of the flagship diagnosis that you might guess is Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Um, it was previously in the Anxiety Disorders category. But we also lumped together um, body dysmorphia, which was previously in what was called the somatoform disorders. Uh, 
Um, two new disorders, hoarding disorder and then skin picking or excoriation. Uh, and then trichotillomania, which is compulsive hair pulling, which was previously in the impulse control disorders. So this new category is really drawing from a lot of other different areas um, and including completely new diagnoses. And this was pretty controversial at the time. Um, there were a lot of folks, honestly myself included, who didn't think that OCD needed to be removed from anxiety disorders because uh, that is the primary kind of driver of it. But um, in the end, the, the DSM-5 committees decided to reorganize it. One, because these disorders, so OCD, BDD, hoarding, and then what's called the BFRBs, or the body-focused repetitive behaviors, skin picking, hair pulling, uh, they really are highly related. Um, and they're related biologically, they're related etiologically, they're treated in very similar ways. Uh, and so there's a lot of evidence showing that these really did group together. And perhaps I think the best reason to do this was to help clinicians be more aware of and treat people who are suffering from these problems. Um, things like, for example, skin picking and uh, hair pulling were often undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, ignored altogether. Uh, because they weren't very uh, common and they weren't really thought of very often. So kind of separating those out brings a little bit more uh, to the forefront of your clinicians if you're thinking, okay, well, I'll check for anxiety disorders, I'll check for mood disorders, I'll check for obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So some, some good things certainly come about from that. Um, now, it was placed right next to the anxiety disorders in the book, uh, to help kind of emphasize the similarities and the overlap between the, the diagnostic categories, which is, I'm sure you're all aware, really are just uh, social constructions, right? So, uh, you know, at least putting them together like that helps you realize that, yeah, these are pretty closely related. Now, these all have features in common, such as... Uh, this kind of obsessive preoccupation or different kinds of repetitive behaviors. Uh, but the focus of the preoccupation and the types of repetitive behaviors you see differ between the disorders. Um, so again, grouped together, but they are different enough to classify them as different disorders. Even something like OCD, which uh, has a large amount, as we'll see, of hoarding behaviors within it is distinct from what we consider a hoarding disorder. Um, and they're treated differently, they have different etiologies, uh, even though they both have that preoccupation aspect and that repetitive behavior aspect. So that just gives you a little bit of an overview of kind of what this classification area is. So that being said, today our focus is on OCD, right? So let's dig into what is obsessive compulsive disorder specifically. In the DSM-5, um, our operational definition that we're using for uh, official diagnosis is first that you have to have the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. Now, this was actually a big change for the DSM-4, which said the presence of obsessions and compulsions. The reason that it now says obsessions, compulsions, or both is to, one, include this um, very small amount of folks who have OCD who seem to have what's often termed pure O, which is pure obsessional OCD, where they are really having a large number of obsessions, but they're not seeing... Um, distinct compulsions related to those. Um, or people who are having compulsions, but maybe are not able to uh, elucidate what their obsessions are. So very young children, for example. Um, you know, the youngest kid that I've treated, who I would say definitely had diagnosable OCD, uh, was between two and a half and three years old. And, you know, she couldn't tell me, oh, here's the, here's the repetitive thought that's in my mind, Dr. Caleb. Like, she couldn't do that, right? She didn't have those language skills. 
But her compulsions and her compulsive behaviors allowed us to, uh, you know, make very reasonable hypotheses as to what those thoughts were, even if she couldn't tell us what they were. Um, so, you know, we didn't know for sure that she was having obsessions, but she definitely was. Um, and so that's the, one of the reasons why this says now obsessions, compulsions, or both. Now, for the overwhelming majority of folks who have OCD, it is both. Uh, and we're talking about 97, 98% of people uh, who have identifiably both. So obsessions, compulsions are both, but what does that mean? Right? Like what's an obsession and what's a compulsion? Well, we define both of those by actually uh, two parts. So for obsessions, the very first aspect is that these are recurrent, persistent, uh, cognitions of some kind. So thoughts or images, urges. And when I experience those intrusive cognitions, um, they are making me feel distressed. Um, I'm not wanting those to happen. I'm not wanting uh, the, the thoughts to be in my mind. And it's making me very upset in some way. I may feel scared. I may feel angry. I may feel just general kind of anxiety. So I have these intrusive, unwanted, disturbing thoughts. And then in order to try and uh, not be distressed, upset from them, what I then do is I try to ignore or suppress those thoughts, or I try to neutralize them. And what we neutralize them with are what are called compulsions. Right? So obsessions happen, and then I'm upset, I'm distressed, I'm not feeling good. Oh, I've got to do this compulsion, which then helps me feel better. And we'll see the exact relationship there in a minute. Now, the most common kinds of obsessive thoughts that we see across the lifespan are thoughts about harming people that you love. Uh, and this isn't like, I want to kill them, right? It's this, again, intrusive, unwanted thought um, where, you know, I have, maybe I have an image flash in my hand or my head of me taking my hand, grabbing scissors and jamming it into my, you know, my parents' face or something like that. And not like, oh yeah, I'd like to do that. Because again, these thoughts cause distress, right? They make me feel very upset. Um, doubts are extraordinarily common where I doubt that I've done something that I have done. Uh, did I really lock that? Really? Did I really close this? Did I really turn this off? Um, so, you know, again, doubting that you've actually done something when you, you definitely have. We see lots and lots of intrusive thoughts about contamination. Um, and these can be a very, very wide variety of contaminants. They can be actual physical contaminants. So I'm worried about some sort of disease or, um, uh, maybe I'm worried about, um, uh, some sort of environmental contaminant like lead or asbestos or radiation, or maybe I'm worried about some sort of a, a moral contaminant. Like one individual I, I treated, for example, couldn't look at people who had disabilities of some kind because they had this intrusive thought that, you know, if they saw someone with a disability, the intrusive thought pops up that I'm going to be like that if I keep looking at. So they were worried about being contaminated, right? But not in any kind of a realistic way, right? Like this is more kind of a moral or um, almost a spiritual sort of contamination. And then we have a lot of people who experience um, thoughts that are, that are incongruent with their actual sexual or um, moral beliefs, um, sexual identity or moral beliefs. So, um, I have, maybe I'm heterosexual, but I have intrusive thoughts of uh, homosexual acts. Or I'm attracted to people my, you know, same age, but I'm having intrusive thoughts of sexual acts with much younger people. Um, or moral acts of, uh, we see a lot of this in the religious area where, you know, I feel like I have blasphemed or I might blaspheme I've offended, you know, God or gods in some sort of way. So these are all obsessions because they make you upset and very distressed when you have them. 
right? That's, that's the real key here with these obsessive thoughts. Um, one of the most common sexual thoughts, for example, is pedophilia. Um, and there's a very, very huge difference between someone who has OCD and is experiencing pedophilic intrusive thoughts and someone who's an actual pedophile. And the difference is how those thoughts cause you to respond emotionally. Right? So in OCD, if someone has an intrusive pedophilic thought, they're very distressed, they're upset, they don't want to have that, it's disturbing to them. Someone who is an actual pedophile, who's actually sexually attracted to people who are much younger than them, they don't have that unpleasantness associated with the thought. Right? It is a, a pleasurable thought or an enjoyable thing to think about. So very, very big difference there. Um, we also see these kinds of differences for a lot of folks with OCD who have intrusive thoughts about self-harm. Um, so again, not wanting to harm themselves, but instead they have these intrusive obsessions about it, which is very different from someone who has something like suicidal ideation or is thinking about self-harm and actually engages in it or wants to do it. Again, very, very different uh, responses emotionally and behaviorally to those thoughts. So those are obsessions. Compulsions, on the other hand, are these very repetitive, either mental acts or um, observable behaviors that you feel like you have to do in response to an obsessive thought. Now, that's a key part, right? Um, repetitive behaviors are very, very common across a lot of different kinds of disorders. We see tons of repetitive behaviors in autism, for example. But they're not the same because obsessive thoughts that cause compulsions right, are different from just repetitive behaviors that happen for some other reason. Um, so I have an obsessive thought, makes me feel anxious. I do a compulsion that makes my anxiety drop. Uh, and, you know, that's really the entire purpose of compulsions. They're not performed because I enjoy them or I'm uh, having fun with them, they're performed to try and prevent and reduce my anxiety and my distress or prevent something terrible from happening. But here's the interesting thing about compulsions. A lot of times they're not realistic in any fashion. Um, so most of you that are listening probably washed your hands today after you used the bathroom. Right? I think that's a fairly fairly reasonable uh, hypothesis. Now, why did you do that? Well, if you're like me, you washed your hands because um, you want to stay clean and have good hygiene, uh, prevent disease transfer, and because like it's kind of gross, right? Like I, I like to be clean, like that's, that's a nice thing. But most of you wash your hands for what we consider a normal amount of time. 15 to 25 seconds, some soap, some water, right? Um, people who engage in compulsive hand washing don't do it just once after they need to. They may do hand washing repeatedly, right? When they don't need to, when their hands are not actually dirty, or they may do it in an excessive fashion. So maybe... Uh, I wash my hands after every time that I touch anything. Or maybe, well, after you use the bathroom, yeah, I wash my hands, but I have to wash them for about three minutes with enormous amounts of soap and water, and the water has to be as hot as I can get it. And I wash them like a surgeon scrubbing in, right? Or, well, I, I only wash them, you know, like 10 times a day, but I use bleach to do it, which is a thing that I've treated many, many times because that's the only way that they, their obsessions felt that they could be clean. Um, so, you know, these sorts of things where we have compulsions, again, they're excessive, right? They're not realistically connected to what you're worried about happening. And they're done in response to obsessions. Right? Now, 
common ones. We just talked about hand washing. That's one a lot of people think about. Um, they see that in the movies a lot, for example. Uh, but it's not the most common one by any means. Um, we see things like checking and ordering, for example, so that ordering may be arranging items on my desk. Um, it may be ordering and arranging where if I touch something with my right side, I then have to touch it with my left side. Um, it could be checking to make sure I lock the doors, checking to make sure I turned off the stove, checking to make sure that my loved one got to work safe. Uh, and doing so, again, excessively. Prayers are a very, very common obsession uh, for folks who are having religious-based, I'm sorry, compulsion for folks who are having religious-based obsessions. Um, and this go, again, very far above the type of prayers that most people would, would engage in. Um, so far beyond what's normal for your religious beliefs. Uh, Counting is a very big one, so that might be counting my steps. That might be uh, one little boy I worked with had to count the number of ceiling tiles in a room, uh, in any room that he walked into. Um, this could be counting, you know, uh, the number of tiles on the floor. This could be uh, turning things up by twos, right? Instead of can't go three, can't go three to six, like we have to go three. Nope, nope, to five, to seven, right? Um, or doing things like thinking a good thought to undo a bad thought, an obsession that you have. And these are just kind of a, a small sampling of the different kinds of obsessions and compulsions that we see. Um, we also see a lot of hoarding um, and saving obsessions and compulsions where I have to keep things for a very particular reason. Um, I had one little little guy I treated, for example, who uh, hoarded uh, rocks. And it wasn't like, I'm a rock collector, this is a neat rock. It was like, well, I saw this rock on my way home from school, so I put it in my pocket, along with the 35 other rocks that I picked up on my way home from school every day, <laughs> right? Uh, and none of which were unique. They were just like gravel, right, like rocks. Um, so lots and lots of different ways that this can manifest. Now, the final aspects of diagnosis is that it's not just that I have obsessions and compulsions, it's that they're taking up a lot of time in my life or they're causing uh, significant distress and impairment in function. Um, now, how much time? Well, typically one or more hours a day is kind of our, our minimum there. Um, it's not uncommon to see folks who might have obsessions and compulsions, but they don't take up that much time per day, or they're not, um, not really distressed by them, or they don't impair my functioning. Um, so with OCD, we're really talking about people whose lives are being negatively impacted because of these obsessions and compulsions. And you all probably have like little quirks to yourself, right? Where like, oh, this, this has to be this way, right? Like th this has to be this way or I feel a little uncomfortable. But it, it's not to the point where, well, if it's not that way, I will completely break down and I will not be able to function today. Right? So there's a big difference between uh, I'm particular about some things and I have OCD. And I think with a lot of people who are very passionate about mental health, um, you know, for me, this is one of the things that kind of gets under my skin the most is when people have like a small quirk and then they're like, oh my God, I'm so OCD. I'm like, no, you're not. You, you've got a small quirk or, oh, you like your straw on the left. Okay, like that's not OCD, right? Uh, but we see, unfortunately, a lot of that. Now, one of the other things that the DSM-5 added with OCD um, are these specifiers. And these specifiers are basically to help you make um, a more specific diagnosis, right? Um, most of these are related to insight, um, all the way from, you know, good or fair insight where someone's like, yeah, these are probably not true, but I should still play it safe and do them, to absent and delusional where it's like, no, this is true. Like, if I don't do this, the bus will crash, right? Like, if I'm not tapping my feet in a certain order when I'm sitting in the bus, it is going to crash and burn and we're all going to die. Um, 
Now, this is a useful thing to know because uh, treatment is much easier with folks who have good or higher levels of insight. Uh, they're much more likely to engage in uh, treatment. They're much more likely to do homework assignments. Uh, so if you've got someone coming in for treatment who has very low level of insight, you may have to do uh, things to increase that insight or to increase their motivation first. The other specifier is about tick-related OCD. And this is where someone has, um, has a chronic tick disorder, either Tourette's or chronic motor or vocal tics, uh, as well as OCD. And the main reason that this specifier is included um, is because uh, people who have tick disorders and OCD don't respond as well to certain kinds of medications. Uh, so that's kind of a, a thing that you would need to know if you are, for example, a psychiatrist or a physician prescribing is whether or not someone has a tick disorder. All right, so let's pause for a second. Questions, thoughts, responses so far. Dr. Lack, you were just saying that um, for if the if your client has poor insight, then you may need to help them kind of see. Can you kind of elaborate or repeat that? I didn't quite understand that necessarily. Yeah. So um, lower levels of insight are very strongly correlated with lower levels of motivation for change. Um, okay. So if someone, for example, is uh, completely convinced that, look, if I don't do this compulsion, I am going to get sick and die. Mm -hmm. Then it's very, very difficult for you to say, well, let's just try, right? And have them jump on board with you. Mm -hmm. um, and so you may have to engage in things like some motivational interviewing techniques, um, maybe more psychoeducation uh, about you know different kinds of OCD that people have and what it looks like uh, to help them kind of crack a little bit of those delusional beliefs. Or you may just have to take treatment slower in general and start with very low level uh, exposures, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, as opposed to the more normal, uh, higher level exposures you would start with. Great, thank you. Yeah. Other questions or thoughts so far? Okay. So I talked about how there's, you know, this pretty wide variety of OCD symptoms. Uh, in our gold standard measure for OCD, which is called the, in children, it's called the CY box the children's Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale. Um, we actually assess over 70 different kinds of uh, obsessions and compulsions. Um, but these tend to break down into a smaller number of categories or what we call symptom dimensions. And most of our research on this um, either lands on the side of four or five symptom dimensions. Um, and you can see an enormous amount of variety within these dimensions, um, but they're, they're pretty comprehensive. So for example, hoarding, what it is that I save or why it is that I save something, you know, you can see an, an infinite variety of that, uh, but it's all related to a saving or a hoarding obsession uh, and then, you know, needing to keep certain things. Uh, contamination and cleaning, same sort of thing what I'm worried about being contaminated with or by and how I'm trying to keep myself safe from that can be enormously different, um, but they're all different aspects of contamination and cleaning. Symmetry and ordering go together. So having to have things a certain way, um, needing things to be a particular way or otherwise, you know, something bad's gonna happen. And then what we call these forbidden thoughts. Uh, and these are usually where we see those uh, sexual or religious based or moral based kinds of obsessions and compulsions. Some of the research finds this uh, over responsibility factor as well, uh, which is more of, you know, thinking about how and how much of an outsized impact my behaviors actually have on the world. Um, so I'll give you one example. So I had a uh, 
uh, uh, he was he was late adolescent, early adult, um, who was training to be an electrician, um, and his obsessions were varied. So he had a lot of religious based obsessions, uh, but the ones that were interfering with his life the most were he was very very convinced that if he was to step on uh, cracks, right. Uh, and this includes not just like sidewalk cracks, but also uh, like where you have tiles and then you have a space between tiles, right? That would be a crack or lines in the floor. That would be a crack. If he was to do that, then something terrible was going to happen to one of his family members. What was? He didn't know. He didn't know. He couldn't tell you, but he knew something terrible was going to happen. And that's obviously ridiculous, right? Like, like it doesn't. Like you stepping on a crack is not going to cause anything to happen to a family member. But for him, he felt that it was. And he had this huge amount of responsibility. Like, this is all on me. Uh, now, how is this impairing his life? Well, you try, you try and go into and wire a building and have to very carefully step to avoid all the cracks in that building and see how long it takes you, right? So he was having massive amounts of disruption there to his uh, work and educational opportunities. So these symptom dimensions, something that's really, really interesting about them to me is that not everybody who has OCD has symptoms in all of these, right? So I could just have it in hoarding or I could just have, you know, uh, contamination. Um, a lot of folks will have it across a couple of different ones but we see a lot of consistency across time. So in other words, if someone is eight years old and they're having symmetry and ordering and contamination uh, symptoms, there's a good chance that we fast forward and we see them at age 18 and they still have those same symptoms in terms of the dementia. What it is that they're saving and hoarding may be very different now. What it is that they're having to order and arrange may be very different. They're going to stay in those same sort of tracks, right? If I've got religious obsessions now in 10 years without treatment, I'm probably still going to be having religious obsessions. Um, so those seem to be pretty consistent across time for almost all people. Uh, and this goes for youth too, right? So if I see somebody at six who's having contamination issues, then at 16, if I have to see them again, it's probably going to be for contamination issues. It may be something completely different, but it's going to be that same kind of dimension. So let's talk prevalence rates. This is a thing that people like to talk about. You know, how many, how often, how common is this? Um, generally speaking, uh, the numbers that you see most often thrown around are these numbers that are on the screen, which is about 1% of the pediatric population uh, and then 2 to 3% of the adult population. Now, there was actually just a meta-analysis released earlier this week, published earlier this week, uh, looking at adult numbers in OCD. And it concluded, and this was a very, very well done meta-analysis over the data from the last 30 years, uh, that the actual likely adult OCD rate was probably closer to 1%, not 2 to 3%, uh, because a lot of those higher numbers came from studies that did not do good diagnostic work, right? So they would rely more on just self-report as opposed to interviews or observations. Um, and so if it's, you know, roughly 1% in our adult population, that means it's probably lower in our pediatric population, um, maybe at, you know, maybe a 0.5% uh, or something like that. We don't have, you know, a meta-analysis on the PEDS numbers yet, but my guess is probably 0.5 to 0.75 based on the new adult data. Uh, so it's not, it's not an incredibly common disorder, right? It's not something like major depression where you know, 20% of the population at some point would be able to be diagnosed with that. Um, so relatively uncommon, um, but not nearly as uncommon as something, for example, like Tourette's disorder, uh, which is more in the 
you know, uh, oh, one percent kind of category. Now, most folks also have, like I mentioned earlier today, uh, both obsessions and compulsions, right? So they're they're definitely, um, you know, the, the the norm is to have obsessions and compulsions that are both pretty easily identifiable. Um, for folks who have obsessions but then don't have any compulsions, uh, there's a really good chance that it's because they're either doing a high amount of avoidance, right? So they're just avoiding a lot of things as a, so that they don't have to engage in compulsions. Uh, or that they're engaging in mental compulsions that they are not really aware of that are compulsions. Uh, so it can, it can certainly be uh, challenging to do <laughs> good diagnostic work with this population. Um, but again, most people have obsessions and compulsions. Uh, I'll give you an example of one of the people that I worked with, this is an adult, because uh, it's an extreme example, so you can see it of avoidance. Um, so this guy, when he first came in, he was in his mid-50s, um, and I asked him about, you know, um, contamination and cleaning, because he was, he was very dirty. He was a very dirty man. Um, obviously not engaging in a lot of hygiene, uh, you know, clothes also very, very dirty, uh, you know, bad smells, things like that. Um, so I asked him about any obsessions about cleanliness and, you know, he definitely had some, but he didn't have any compulsions he was engaging in right then. Well, the reason he didn't have any compulsions was because he was avoiding all the situations that would lead him to do the compulsive behaviors. So when I saw him, for example, he hadn't showered in about three months um, because the last time he took a shower, it took him about 12 hours. Continuous, right? So he was in there continuously for 12 hours. Um, and most of that was not with, you know, nice warm water. Um, so he had just been avoiding doing that. Right, because one of his compulsions was cleaning, right? So he had these cleaning compulsions where when he would start, it would be very, very hard for him to stop. Um, he hadn't brushed his teeth in, he said, at least five years, but it was probably closer to 10 years. Because the last time that he remembered brushing his teeth, he had brushed them for about three hours and his gums were just bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. So he just completely avoided it, right? So he wasn't doing those compulsions but that's only because he was avoiding those things. Um, and we can see that sort of thing with all different kinds of obsessions, for sure. So compulsions don't have to be one type or one behavior specifically. It could be like type of behavior, like cleaning can expand showering, brushing teeth, washing hands. Yes. So, Correct, okay. Um, typically, Specific obsessions will trigger very specific compulsions, though, right? So for him, he goes and he, you know, gets ready to brush his teeth, and he has the obsession that if you don't brush them well, then you're going to have gum disease. Okay, so now I've got to really brush them well, right? Um, or, you know, I had one little boy that I treated who, uh, <coughs> excuse me, he would not eat from food that had been opened already, like packaged food, right? So like a box of cereal, we opened that yesterday. I'm not touching that, right? Uh, now, did he have a compulsion about it? Well, he would compulsively not eat, but that's not doing something is not a compulsion. That's avoidance, right? So um, he would have that obsession of this is contaminated, this is unclean, so therefore... I have to open up a new box of cereal to eat from, right? Um, and so we see that very clear link between specific obsession resulting in specific compulsions. Did that and, answer your question, Katja? And on that note too, like I have a student who is on the autism spectrum and you can, he has certain tendencies where like he, avoidance just keeps coming to my mind that he would avoid. And I, I mean, I'm trying to see it through the lens of, you know, 
which diagnosis could it be? Because mom, because the family is trying to explore, because he has certain anxieties and other things um, that trigger certain responses. And so I'm just like thinking about that student as I'm hearing you talk about this. And so I didn't know like the comorbidity of OCD with um, other things. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll talk about it specifically here in a minute. Um, mm -hmm. So you see much higher rates of OCD in the autistic population than you do the general population for sure. Uh, but it's still, it's not like, oh, everyone with this has this, right? So uh, it's still a low percentage. It's much higher than the general population, but we're talking more like five to 10 to 15%, right? Uh, in the autistic population, as opposed to under 1% in the general population. Mm. And, and that, uh, Emily, that's a, that's a great example of why things like a functional analysis are so important in the context of doing differential diagnosis, uh, because I can have two people who are engaging in roughly the same behavior, but can be doing it for very different reasons, right? Um, so that's why uh, a good case formulation and a functional analysis allows you to figure out Okay, well, what is the reason that they're doing that, right? And what's the, the consequence from them doing that? So what's maintaining it, in other words? Um, because if I have an obsession that results in a compulsion, I'm going to treat that differently than I am another kind of repetitive behavior that's happening not because of a compulsion, right? Where we may look more at modifying the antecedents and the, uh, you know, the consequences of you know, them engaging in that behavior. And those may be external as opposed to more internal ones like we see with OCD. Good questions, good questions. So uh, in terms of how OCD happens, uh, it's usually a pretty gradual onset. Um, and it's usually fairly unremitting and pretty chronic if you don't treat it. Um, so usually it starts small and then just gets you know larger and larger and larger over time in terms of the number of obsessions and compulsions and the time that you spend with those. Um, and it doesn't tend to naturally remit. Um, so some problems um, are much more likely to naturally remit over time. Depression, for example, is one of those uh, where about 90% of people who have a major depressive episode a year later will be remitted just naturally with no treatment or anything. Um, we don't see that with OCD. If anything, we would see the opposite kind of pattern um, where it's only this really, really tiny number of folks who remit naturally. And like I mentioned earlier, the symptoms can change over time, but they rarely just disappear. And as they change, they tend to stay in those same dimensions, right? So it stays in some sort of contamination aspect, or it's a different type of, uh, you know, sexual obsession, but it's still a sexual obsession across time. Um, so it tends to be gradual, pretty unremitting. Um, in youth, we actually see a lot more males that are diagnosed than females. Um, in adults, um, we've traditionally seen pretty equal numbers of males and females. Again, this new meta-analysis that just came out uh, showed slightly more females than males. Uh, so, you know, that may be, as we get more and more numbers and information, that may be shifting that a little bit. Um, but in, in youth, so particularly pre-pubertal youth, um, you tend to see two to three times as many males as you do females with this. Um, so much more common. We also see some different uh, patterns of comorbidity where males are more likely to have um, things like tick disorders or generalized anxiety, um, while females are more likely to have uh, things like social anxiety uh, or body dysmorphia or those body focused repetitive behaviors. Those are more likely comorbids in our female population. And comorbidity is certainly the rule rather than the exception. Um, where 
in our you know, community samples, we see 75% plus uh, of our patients that present with comorbid disorders. Um, I'm going to be honest, I have seen OCD patients for 16 plus years now. Um, and I can't think of a single one that did not have at least one other diagnosable comorbid disorder. Um, in kiddos, you're likely to see diagnoses, right or wrong, of ADHD. Um, you see a large amount of oppositional behavior and like ODD diagnoses, large amounts of depressive disorders, um, large amounts of anxiety disorders, um, and a number of these are secondary to the OCD. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I'm having depressive symptoms or I'm having social anxiety, um, or I'm having oppositional behavior because of my OCD. So if you treat the OCD, then those other things naturally will get across time. Um, now, how would something like that look? Like, what would that look like? Well, let's say that I've got OCD, right? Um, I'm an eight-year-old with OCD and I've got contamination-based problems. Um, one of the things that we see in a very large portion of the OCD population is that when they are prevented from engaging in compulsions, their uh, efforts to engage in those compulsions massively increase, right? So you see what we call extinction bursts. Um, and those extinction bursts are really trying to allow me to engage in my compulsion. And for about 50% or so of kids with OCD, those extinction bursts and those attempts to engage look like very aggressive behavior. So fighting, arguing, hitting, spitting, kicking, breaking things until I'm able to engage in my compulsion. And why am I doing that? I'm doing that because my anxiety is so high and I feel like it's not going to go down until I engage in my compulsion. So it's a fight, right? And it's a fight between the person's OCD and the environment that's trying to prevent them from doing the OCD behaviors. And a lot of times that comes across as being very oppositional, very negative, very defiant. Uh, towards those things that are standing between me and doing my compulsion. And so if I then address the OCD, those defiance behaviors go away. We see that OCD causes, again, huge amounts of functional impairment, like we'll see in a minute, which can then result in depressive symptoms and can result in being anxious of those, because of those symptoms. And so if we treat that OCD, those things will naturally resolve. Um, so you do see a lot of comorbid diagnoses. Um, you see a lot of overlap uh, with the other OCRDs. So a lot of overlap with um, in late adolescence and adults body dysmorphia, uh, but also a lot of overlap with uh, the skin picking and hair pulling disorders, uh, fairly large overlap uh, with hoarding disorder. Um, in adult populations in particular. And what's interesting is that the more comorbid disorders you have, the lower quality of life you're going to be having. And that's actually more predictive of your quality of life than your OCD severity is. So in other words, if my OCD is causing me to have these other problems, that's worse than if I just have super high OCD, right? Then lower OCD plus depression or plus anxiety, or plus uh, oppositional behavior. So lots and lots of impairment, um, which is kind of the norm, honestly. Basically, all children who have OCD report that, one, those obsessions cause me to have you know, very significant levels of distress. And that can be reported as feeling scared, feeling anxious, feeling nervous, worried, angry, etc. cetera. Um, but basically everybody who has obsessions says, yes, this makes me feel bad. And when we look at kids who have OCD, 
and we compare them to kids who don't, we see this massive drop in their overall quality of life, um, where they're going to be having fewer numbers of friends. Um, the numbers of friends they have, the quality of those is lower. Uh, they tend to have higher problems in school. Um, so they tend to have lower grades, um, are held back more often, um, more likely in, in trouble from the teacher. Their participation in recreational activities is much lower than folks who do not have OCD. So uh, that can be things like you know sports, but that's also uh, different kinds of clubs or church activities, social organizations, you know, Girl Scouts, things like that, all much, much lower in kids who have OCD. Now, in terms of what causes OCD, um, it's, there's definitely a large amount of biological impact. Um, so in adults, we see estimates anywhere from 27 to 47% for heritability. Um, for child onset, it's actually much higher, anywhere from 45 to 65%. Um, so m higher genetic loadings, basically, for folks who have OCD as a child. Um, but that's still a lot of wiggle room, right? So that means that your environment is still a very important contributor to OCD. Um, and our most well-supported model for you know why someone has OCD from a psychosocial model is the cognitive behavioral one. And that is what we're going to come back to after a quick break and talk about, All right? So we'll take like a 10 minute break or so and I'll see you guys in a minute. So like I had said right before we took our break, environment, obviously a big contributor to OCD. And our cognitive behavioral model is far and away the most well supported. Uh, now, I actually, I give, I give about an hour long lecture on OCD etiology. Uh, I'm not going to give <laughs> all of that <coughs> right now today, um, but I can uh, send you the link if you're terribly interested. Um, but kind of in brief, you know, for, just like with any cognitive behavioral model of any kind of mental health problem, um, you know, we're talking about this bi-directional uh, impact of behavior and cognition and both of those influencing emotion and us trying to figure out, okay, well, what's causing those different behaviors, cognitions, emotions to become maladaptive, right, to go awry. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, obsessional thoughts is that all of us, everyone, uh, has intrusive thoughts, right? All of us do. Um, and the content of those intrusive thoughts in people who do and do not have OCD is virtually identical. So in other words, the, the kinds of intrusive thoughts that people who have OCD have are the same that we all have. But only a very, very small fraction of our population has OCD, you know, 1% or so. So why is that? Like, what's the difference? Well, a lot of that is that we have underlying beliefs that are then activated because of those thoughts. And those underlying beliefs, which we can talk about here in a minute, cause those um, normal intrusive thoughts to be appraised in a very different way than say I appraise those right so let's say let's say for example I'm walking down the street just having a good time minding my own business uh, walking down the street and I see somebody walking towards me with a puppy on a leash right it's like oh look at that look at that puppy and then I might have an intrusive thought just pop into my head. That's like, kick it into traffic, right? Or I, like, I, see, I see like a vision of, of me like just booting this puppy into oncoming traffic and then getting smashed by a bus, right? And then because I don't have OCD, right? I don't have OCD. I'm like, ah, <laughs> that's weird. Uh, why did my brain do that? That's crazy. Hi, puppy. Don't worry, right? You're not in danger from me. 
And then I just go on about my business, right? I don't think about it again. I'm not worried about it or concerned about it. But in OCD, we see an enormous amount of people who would have that kind of a thought and then think, oh my God, this really means something. Like this, this is important. What, what does this mean about me? What, what does that say about me as a person that I would have that kind of a thought come into my head about kicking that puppy into oncoming traffic? And so you take those normal thoughts and then all of a sudden now you're saying this is dangerous, right? This makes me upset or distressed because what does this mean, right? I'm a terrible person that this could happen. Uh, for a large, large number of folks with OCD, we see a lot of what we call thought fusion action, which is this idea that like thinking something is basically the same as doing, it, right? Um, and we see we see this in other things too, and and in a number of uh, religious worldviews as well, where like the thought is the same as the the doing thereof. Um, but in OCD, it kind of goes to this whole new level, right? Where oh, um, I then, you know, I'm, I'm upset and I try <laughs> can't just saw the upcoming slide and was like, oh, what's this? Hold on. It's fun. Um, and, you know, then I'm upset. What happens when we're upset? Any of us? Well, we try and do something to reduce our, our distress and being upset. And usually that's some sort of an escape or an avoidance behavior. Um, in OCD, those are called compulsions, right? Those compulsions are trying to escape and avoid the distress caused by the obsession. And then that, it turns out, doesn't make me not have that thought again. That actually reinforces that maladaptive belief, which is going to cause me to, uh, you know, appreciate that thought in a different way and say, instead of, oh, it's a thought, it doesn't mean anything. It's, oh my God, it's a thought, it means something. Which then perpetuates the circle or a cycle of uh, obsession, distress, compulsion. Obsession, distress, compulsion. So let's, let's take a look at an example. Let's say you've got a baby, all right? So a number of people do, they're out there, they're fairly frequent. Um, let's say you got a little baby, all right? And this baby, uh, we'll, we'll call it uh, Mark. Um, Mark here is raised in a very fundamentalist, evangelical, religious household. And part of the things that Mark you know, learns during this household being in here is things like, well, you know, the devil can put thoughts into your head. Um, you know, we have to try and stay pure. We always have to try and avoid sinful behavior or bad behavior in some way. Um, you know, these are things that we need to do. And then one day you've, you've got little Mark. You know, he's just you know, he's four or five. He's just uh, doodling with his pencil, right? Just doodling, just drawing with his pencil there. And he happens to draw two bisect or intersecting lines, right? And one of those lines just happens to fall slightly below the middle of the other. And so you've got an, an upside down T, right? And so he's just doodling, he's drawing this, and then one of his parents walks by, sees what he's done, becomes immediately upset, enraged. Oh my gosh, what have you drawn? Why are you drawing such blasphemous things? This is terrible. Can't believe you did this. This is awful. And that causes young Mark to get what? Very upset, right? Um, and it really activates those beliefs that Mark has been learning about through his religious instruction in terms of, of you know, being sinful and evil and bad and what happens to bad people. Uh, and then what we see is he's upset, right? Just like you get, like people get upset. And I know my illustrations are breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, I know, I know, don't, don't cry too much. But little Mark's crying. He's crying because dad's yelling at him, telling him he's going to go to hell unless he prays for forgiveness, right? Like you drew this blasphemous symbol. How dare you? How dare you? And so he prays, right? He prays and then he feels better. He feels better. Why? Well, now I'm not going to hell. Like, hey, yay, that's great. I'd rather not burn for all eternity. And he feels much better, right? And then we're good to go. And that might be, that might be the end of it. 
for most kids. But let's say that Mark has a genetic predisposition towards anxiety and OCD and a predisposition towards, you know, um, making a very, very big deal out of thoughts because of that genetic influence and that environmental influence he's had growing up. Well, what we see then is that the cycle then starts where when you have environmental triggers, uh, like let's say, for example, seeing an upside down cross, an upside down T, that would then cause this intrusive thought, oh my gosh, you know, the devil is trying to, uh, to make me sin or to turn me away from God and make me evil. And that intrusive thought of maybe, maybe I want to draw an upside down cross. Maybe that's what I want to do. Is then going to get very threateningly appraised, right? Well, it, oh, what does that mean? That means, oh my God, if I want to do that, then I'm terrible. I'm an awful person. I'm probably going to go to hell, which then makes me very, very upset. And then I think back and I remember like last time I was upset, oh, what did I do? I prayed for forgiveness. I guess I better do that again, which causes a decrease in your anxiety, which is great, except for the fact that decreasing that anxiety via compulsions actually reinforces the compulsion, reinforces those threatening appraisals, and in turn makes the obsession more likely to occur. Because now I've started reinforcing that this is something that happens, right? This is, this is the cycle that I'm getting into. And just like we see if I tell all of you not to think of something, right? And I say like, oh, uh, don't think of a, a purple giraffe with yellow spots. You're all going to be like, well, like, well, that's weird, right? Or maybe you'll have to try and think of something else but then, oof, there we go again. It's coming back in your mind. You'll be thinking about it for the next three or four days. And every time you'll be like, damn it, Lack, why did you have to do that? Or any of you who've had a song stuck in your head before. Right? How does it go just to try and not think about it? Terribly, right? It doesn't go away, right? It just makes it worse. And then you're stuck in that same like four second loop of that song that you used to like, but now I hate it, right? And I can't believe that it's just over and over and over and over. Because just trying not to think about something, trying to distract yourself from thinking about something doesn't work because it comes back stronger then. It's the same thing in OCD. So people get stuck in this cycle of Intrusive thought, threatening appraisal, distress, compulsion, decrease in anxiety, but now it's happening again and again and again. All right. Now, Katja, ask your question. I feel like I kind of know the answer now, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, with the pandemic, does individuals who have a pre genetic predisposition to anxiety and OCD, are we seeing it? increase of this OCD manifesting, especially if they have like fear of contamination. Yeah. So, so the, um, the interesting thing about OCD is that you can't give it to people, right? You have to have this biological predisposition that's then activated by your environment. So, so while we won't and don't see an increase in number of people who have OCD overall, what we are seeing uh, is very interesting, which is that when the pandemic first uh, became very large here in the U.S., for example, and people were given, given orders, stay home, wash your hands, you know, as much as possible, wear a mask when you're going outside, like avoid people, all these things. What we saw was a large number of our folks who have contamination-based OCD going, <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. Right. I was right. Um, Y'all didn't listen to me. And look what happened. Right. So we saw a lot of people feel initially very vindicated. Um, but we don't see new people developing OCD that's related to that. Um, or people shifting their OCD necessarily. Because OCD is incredibly specific. 
So if, <clears throat> if somebody was already worried about germs or infection, then yeah, they're probably going to be upping, you know, the number of compulsions they're doing and having higher amounts of uh, obsessions. But someone who has an OCD that's not related to that isn't going to then develop OCD symptoms outside of those dimensions, right, that they originally had them in. So somebody who um, is kind of like on the cusp of developing OCD, like one of these kids, um, if they were on the cusp of developing some sort of contamination-based OCD, then yes, they very well might have obsessions about COVID, which I've certainly seen, right? Um, but I've also seen it just a my, massive, massive increase, and it's not just me, this is, is data worldwide, in anxiety and distress, right? Uh, and it's, and it's, it's gone way up for adults, adolescents, and youth. Um, but here's the interesting thing. We know this from prior pandemics, uh, both this century in other, other nations and last century in our own, which is that people's behaviors very, very quickly revert back to baseline normal when we're no longer in a pandemic state. So in other words, um, by next year at this time, uh, we've got vaccinated, everybody's doing okay, like numbers are way, way down. You're not going to see people continuing to engage in those kinds of like uh, obsessive cleaning or ritualistic kinds of cleaning uh, behaviors because, oh, I don't need to now, I'm okay, which is very different than an OCD, right? which is very reinforced through these internal mechanisms instead of externally reinforced uh, like we would see for most people's behaviors in the pandemic. Did that answer your question? All right. All right. All right. Other questions so far? Does this make sense? Does this kind of cycle make sense to everybody? It does make sense. I keep hearing you say like the internal triggers um, or like the internal rather than external um even though you know your example was by an external trigger of drawing something and someone reacted the internal trigger is that individual thinking and their belief system being reinforced and their thoughts is am i tracking or yeah. so so initially and this is actually across most of the anxiety problems that we see fear-based problems initially they develop due to external factors, but then they're maintained via internal factors. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this idea or this understanding actually dates back to the 1940s with a psychologist named Maurer. Uh, and it's what's called Maurer's two factor or, or uh, yeah, usually two factors, what they call two factor uh, theory of avoidance. Um, and so, you know, initially, I may be afraid of something because of an external stimulus, right? But then that fear becomes maintained through negative reinforcement, right? I do this compulsion, it takes away my distress. As opposed to I do this behavior, someone punishes me. So what we see in phobias and fears and OCD is those compulsions are very negatively reinforced, right? I do it, I feel better. I do it, I feel better. I'm going to keep doing it because I feel better. Um, and so, you know, you've got this uh, initial kind of um, conditioning or, or uh, classical kind of conditioning that, that may give you this or help start this, but then it's more operantly reinforced across time and maintained. Other questions or thoughts so far? All right. Now, now this understanding of, um, of OCD and, and of generally of, of fear-based behaviors is really at the heart of how we then treat it using cognitive behavioral techniques, right? And you can, you can think about that if you take a look here, right? So, um, if we think about, you know, how cognitions, emotions, and behavior interact, we've got different things that we can do. So we could, for example, we could change the antecedents here, right, and make it so that 
there's no triggers for this person's uh, intrusive thoughts, right? Okay, well, that might fix their OCD as long as they're in an extraordinarily highly contained environment, right? which it turns out most of us aren't. Uh, so maybe that's not the best thing to do to fix this. Well, can we fix whether or not someone has an intrusive thought? Not really. We can't just like, you know, be like, all right, stop it. And it turns out that doesn't work. But we could maybe work on this threatening appraisal. And so we can actually use what are called cognitive restructuring techniques to change how I respond to that thought, right? Whether or not that thought needs to be seen as dangerous. And can I directly target your distress? Well, no, I can't be like, stop, stop being anxious, right? You all have probably told someone that before, right? And it worked really well, right? Like, stop being sad, stop being worried. And you're like, oh, no problem. No, but we can target these compulsions. And we can target those compulsions through what we call response prevention. Uh, and that's why our treatment is called exposure with response prevention. We expose you to those triggers, right? And then we prevent your natural anxiety-based response, which breaks this cycle of reinforcing those appraisals and those intrusive thoughts. And we'll see exactly how we do that here in a minute. Now, if we're going to treat OCD, which we should want to do, um, then we should be treating it with cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, I know you guys read in the HUP book, uh, your what not to do uh, about all these other things that are out there that people might try and why they don't work and why they're non-scientific. Here's what we do, which is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And it is the treatment of choice both for adults and for youth. Uh, it's superior to medications alone. And it really focuses on what we call exposure with response prevention uh, or EXRP. Most of the time now it's ERP, you'll see that a lot. And it has really, really good effect sizes. Um, so anywhere from 88 to 95% of people who go through cognitive therapy for OCD improve. Um, it also has a very, very low relapse rate, which is awesome. Uh, about 12% of people will relapse afterwards. Uh, if you look at medication relapse rates, you're talking anywhere from 80 to 95 percent of people will relapse uh, when they stop taking medications. Uh, we do see a pretty high dropout rate right now. About a quarter um, of people will drop out before treatment is completed, um, usually in the first couple of sessions, which is problematic for sure. Um, it's actually been a major focus of research over the last uh, decade in terms of basically how can we reduce those dropout rates. Um, and we've got some very interesting things we're trying, uh, which if we have time, we can talk about later, uh, probably next week. In terms of outcomes, who does better, who does worse? Um, one of the things that we know from uh, a lot of research is those folks who have hoarding symptoms tend to respond less well to treatment. Um, that seems to be related to those who have hoarding symptoms having lower overall insight into whether or not those are reasonable. Um, we see very similar results in hoarding disorder, uh, which is pretty treatment resistant. We actually see very low uh, success rates, even with our best at this point therapies for hoarding disorder. Um, so there's something about those symptoms that really seems to uh, be resistant to treatment. Um, for folks who uh, are pretty low motivated, low, uh, low insight, you may need to add motivational enhancement techniques like we see for motivational interviewing um, in order to get them to be able to perform the exposures. Um, but that seems to be a, a pretty big boost in terms of getting people to do exposures. And the other cool thing that we see is that group therapy is actually as effective as individual therapy for OCD. Um, and a large part of that seems to come from the fact that you've got an enormous amount of modeling that takes place there. So one of the interesting things about OCD is that just because you have OCD doesn't mean that you can't recognize other people's OCD symptoms are completely ridiculous. 
Uh, and so when you bring together a bunch of people who have OCD in a group, they're very good at pointing out like, look, yeah, that's silly. That's silly. Mine's real. Mine's real though. Like mine is really concerning. Like, I didn't know we shouldn't argue about mine, but yours is ridiculous. I can't believe somebody would think that, but mine's okay. Like mine's real. Um, so you get to see a lot of modeling take place in there, uh, which is really fun and people helping each other out. Um, <clears throat> comorbidity doesn't have an impact uh, on how well treatment works in terms of CBT. Um, people who have comorbidity tend to be a little more severe overall, but they respond equally well. Um, and I alluded to this earlier, but uh, comorbid depressive and anxious symptoms, things like that, they improve even if we don't target them uh, because a lot of times they're secondary to the OCD, uh, which is really interesting. This just gives you an idea about some of our earlier trials in OCD that really helped show like, hey, this, this helps, like CBT is really, really working well. Um, the blue bars that you can see, those are folks who are in the exposure and response prevention arms compared to our control arms, uh, where we would see very small amounts of change or, you know, even people getting worse uh, compared to changes of 30 to 60 plus percent decreases in symptoms um, when you see ERP, which is, has been found pretty consistently, honestly, over the last 20 years, um, is that we see depending upon kind of how well or the level of expertise of people who are treating it, you can see decreases anywhere from 60 to 85, 90%. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. And you can see them over relatively short periods of time. Uh, so what does that look like though, right? What, what does it look like when we put together this kind of treatment package for obsessive compulsive disorder? Well, generally you're talking anywhere between 10 and 16 sessions. Um, this has been delivered in a number of ways. Um, so kind of standard weekly outpatient treatment, um, intensive treatment, which is, you know, like on a daily basis uh, for about three to four weeks, um, or um, intensive inpatient treatment as well, which might be two or three sessions a day for, you know, two or three weeks. And we see, we see relatively similar uh, outcomes for all those different ways that it's delivered. So it may just be more of, you know, how severe you are would guide, you know, the, the level of intensive treatment that we would give you. But again, typically between 10 and 16 sessions. Um, when you're treating youth, the family is included in everything. Um, so you're including at least one parent and the child in all the aspects of treatment. Uh, if you've got multiple parents in the home, even better if they can both come. If you have other caregivers or support people, uh, grandparents, older siblings even, bringing them into the treatment is, is very recommended. And there's three primary components. Um, there's <clears throat> psychoeducation, which is a lot like what we've already done today. There's parent education, right, which is basically helping the parents get the tools they need in order to help their child. And then there's going forward with doing the exposure and response prevention um, combined with cognitive strategies, uh, cognitive restructuring in particular. So we kind of divided into these, uh, you know, these different areas, you know, what are we trying to teach to who? Well, everyone needs to get psychoeducation. Um, and that's, you know, providing, you know, factual information about OCD, what causes it, what does it look like, how's it maintained, uh, all the sort of information that we've been talking about. Then you correct any misattributions. Um, so if they, you know, think, well, OCD just happens because of a chemical imbalance or, or you're not taking enough vitamins or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but then you also help them differentiate between behaviors that are OCD related and those that are not. Um, so we see, you know, a fairly large number of kids who have OCD who would also qualify for an ADHD diagnosis. 
um, and helping them separate out, you know, well, what are the symptoms that are being caused by OCD versus something else uh, is often very, very important. And then your education really describes your treatment program. What are we going to do? How does it work? How long does it take? Those sorts of things. Right? So again, a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about here. And then you give the parent tools and you give the child tools throughout treatment. Um, so parents have to learn things like differential attention. Uh, what do I pay attention to and reinforce? What can I safely ignore? They also need to learn about how to model appropriate behavior for their children. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a very old saying about the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And for a lot of these kids with OCD, guess where they're getting those genetic loadings for anxiety from? Well, from the tree they fell from, right? Uh, so it's not uncommon at all to see one or even both parents who not necessarily have OCD, but are higher on the anxiety spectrum, tend to have higher amounts of anxiety-based responses to things. Um, so we help them say, okay, well, what sort of behavior do you want to model for your child? And how do you do that? And then we also teach them about scaffolding. Um, and here, when we talk about scaffolding, what we're talking about is how do I support my child in being able to reach the heights that they need to, right? Specifically with their homework assignments, being able to do the exposures, being able to beat OCD, right? How do I provide support for them so that they can succeed and not fail? Now, the child tools, the two big ones we have there is learning to externalize OCD and then learning how to rate your anxiety. Now, what do I mean when I say externalizing OCD? Well, for a lot of kids and adults, honestly, who come in who have OCD, what they're doing is they're saying things like me, right? There's something wrong with me. I'm doing this. I did this. I did this. And so what we do is we start trying to have them separate me and OCD, right? Because right now it's like this. <laughs> it's right, me and OCD, we're all together. And so we start trying to differentiate that and externalize it, where it's not I'm fighting against myself, it's I'm fighting against OCD, right? I'm going to learn how to argue with OCD. I'm going to learn how to beat OCD up, fight OCD. And depending on the age of the child, we may do things like draw a picture of OCD, we may give it a name, we may, uh, you know, describe it so that we can talk about how do we fight it, how do we beat it. Uh, one of my favorites ever was this little girl who was about six, uh, and I was talking to her about, you know, externalizing it, we're going to fight OCD, because right now OCD is controlling you, and it's telling you what to do, and it's bossing you around. It's like, you know, what, what do you want to call it? What do you want to call it when we're arguing against it and telling it, you know, how it needs to stop lying to us? And she just looked at me and she just went, Bob. Okay, <laughs> like, that's fine. I don't know why. She didn't know why. I was like, is there a Bob she doesn't like, Mom? And her mom's like, we don't even know anyone named Bob, right? She was just like, no, nope, just Bob. And I was like, all right, we're going to fight Bob. Uh, we're going to tell Bob what a liar he is, and, you know, but that's a really useful tool because it's so much easier to fight someone else than it is to fight yourself. And then we talk about how do we rate our anxiety, um, and we introduce them to things like SUDs or subjective units of distress, uh, which we'll spend a lot of time talking about here next week. I think. Now... One big thing, just like we have talked about numerous times in class, is that we are always going to keep our information and our activities developmentally appropriate. Right? Um, so for young, young kids, you know, usually below eight, a lot of times they don't need the psychoeducation portion. Um, they're not going to understand a lot of it. They're not going to benefit from it. So why force them to sit there and right? let them play in the other room or you know, watch a show or something like that for a few minutes on a screen while you're giving that to their parents. Um, but for older kids and for adolescents, we definitely want them to be involved. We want them to, uh, you know, be part of that education. 
And you always have to think about, you know, we're delivering treatment with the child, right? With the family. I'm not doing treatment to them or on them, right? They're an integral part <clears throat> and we're working together to do this, right? Like we're working together. Um, we're a team and we're all fighting OCD. All right, now that's the first half of my workshop on OCD. Obviously, that's longer than what you've got. You guys are going to be like an hour. Um, but I included a lot more information, spent a lot more time, because a lot of it is very uh, similar to what you all will be doing and talking about. So, so you can get a lot of different uh, ideas and kind of how you'll be presenting things. But questions so far? Questions about CBT for OCD? So far, anyway. Or about OCD generally. Everybody all right? Okay. Well, next week, what we'll do is we'll really get into the, here's what this looks like on kind of a session by session basis, right? A step by step basis. And we'll walk through what those 10 to 16 sessions really look like. Um, if we're in person, <laughs> we'll have some hands-on demonstrations and things like that. Uh, if not, then we will work it out and we'll do it, uh, we'll do it how, however we need to. But uh, right now it looks like we should be in person next week. So uh, hopefully that will be, will be what happens. So, all right. Um, all right, well, uh, school psychs, you are dismissed. I'm going to have the MFT and the counseling folks hang out for just a minute and see if they have any questions about anything related to practicum. Um, but we'll see all y'all next week. All right. Hi, folks. Uh, we got any questions for me? I think I got emails from all to most of you uh, about practicum and all of the applications digitally and such. So if you haven't sent that in, feel free to do that. Um, so there you go. What do you guys have for questions for me? Can you remind us what we talked about um, in regards of getting Dr. Sears' signature um, or for her to review our application? Yeah, so basically when campus opens and you can get it. Okay, so, no, uh, okay so you understand and we're all, as long as we can get that to you, we're yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I do want a hard copy eventually of everybody's you know, okay. delivered uh, to me, please but I'll start working on everything with the digital copies I have now. Okay, good deal, thank you. Any other questions? Um, do you have any kind of like just a loose time frame as to when we might potentially be able to expect to need to call the places? Yeah, so my, my hope is that I'm able to get um, everything done within the next 10 days or so. Okay. Um, part of that will depend upon how quickly other faculty get back to me about things. Um, but I hope to have it done before 1st of March. Anybody else? Questions, thoughts, concerns? Um, I have a workshop question, but I probably should ask you so everybody could hear, but I just thought of it. That's fine. Um, <laughs> Jara and I have been looking for like our readings and stuff and um, the ones that we have are one of them is like 2015 and the other two are uh, I think a little bit over 10 years old. Are you like a stickler like it has to be five years or no. Okay. Some teachers are like if it's before that then you know so. No. Uh, as long as I did, we I did look within cool. like super recent but it just doesn't have very many options that's fine that's okay fine. anybody else anything else 
All right. Well, um, there you go. I'll be, uh, you know, sending emails out and letting you guys know that you're approved as quickly as I can get through everything. And uh, so I'll be doing that. And then after that, you're free and welcome to to start contacting places. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'll see you next week, hopefully in person. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.